Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Nashville touring and session great, David Northrup. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's a time, uh, it's a time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Lots of musicians, comedians, actors, thought leaders, lots of drummers. Drummers are the lifeblood of any music scene, and uh, we are in the last place to have a music career. Nashville, Tennessee. This one is long overdue, longtime friend, um, hailing from Syracuse, New York. These are just a few of the names he's played with. Travis Tritt, longtime, Joe Nichols, Boss. Skaggs, Oak Ridge Boys, Winona, Rick Derringer, the list goes on and on. I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that. And we've shared a lot of the same gigs, so I'm sure we can uh, share some stories here in a public forum. Oh, yeah. Our friend, David Northrup. How you doing, David? Rich, thanks for having me, my friend. Buddy, you and I have been parts of the Nashville music community for decades. It's unbelievable how 22 becomes 52 you i don't know how it happened but i think you moved here in 95 i moved here in 97 and i quickly met you and we were mm -hmm. kindred spirits and every time we saw each other we'd hug each other we were yeah. very supportive of each other and i'm just so happy that you were able to buy a house raise a family uh do all the things that normal people do hitting a bunch of plastic and wood and metal with yeah, two man. Sticks. Pretty incredible. Congratulations. Boy. Oh, yeah. Likewise, dude. What a blessing. How, how privileged we are. Yes, we are. Know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a great ride. Yes, for sure. So 1995 is when you decide to move to Nashville. But there's a backstory there. Um, what, you know, I was reading, I was kind of like, we talk about the trolls all the time. I wasn't trolling you, but I was doing my research. And uh, we have a, a mutual friend that one of your teachers, Frank Briggs. I love Frank. Oh, yeah, man. Frank's amazing. It, so, Frank is the, the most underrated, unknown drumming monster i think in the drumming community absolutely he doesn't get his credit but no he, he was in this amazing band this 805 oh, band and yeah. then he moved to los angeles and he was part a staple of that scene and of course he's got this um man this kind of like a it's one of those iconic uh videos and books that he put out back in the day that, oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the name of it. I'm sorry, Frank. But Frank and I became dear friends through our mutual friend, Jason Sutter, and I hired mm -hmm. him at my L.A. Drummers Weekend, and he just awesome. knocked the, he just knocked it out of the ballpark. And then, oh, we, awesome. you know, we've become social. We get together and, and, and do the thing. Yeah, you know? great guy. Huge, huge impact, huge influence on uh, me personally as a young musician coming up in the ranks. And uh, even after he moved to L.A., I stayed in contact with him. And he was just such a great source of, of, of information on things to do, things not to do, you know. And, and you know, with, with the, the, the business of music and also with uh, how to conduct yourself, with trying to get endorsements, and just, just a long list of stuff that, you know, you, you wouldn't expect to get from a childhood uh, teacher. You know, I took lessons with him when I was in my teens, you know. Yeah, and then he moved out to L.A. and just really took it by the the horns and kicked some butt. And and I was just fortunate to have a guy like that really uh, do a lot to help me. You know, things not to do. Sometimes that's more important. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to figure Good out what time. to do, but definitely don't do these things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because because that'll definitely change the trajectory of your career. But yeah, you should reach out to him because he is actually, um, I think he is ready to spend more time relaxing in his life he bought a place yeah. in joshua tree california and he's yes, just he going to be enjoying making life furniture. making friends yeah, okay so you furniture. have been in touch hanging with out in the desert oh dude oh yeah dude love that guy yeah i love it out there yeah. well Good who cat. were some of your first teachers like and and what was the bug like you know for a lot of drummers just a little bit older than than us it was you know 1964 ladies and gentlemen the beatles you know and yeah. you know for me it yeah. was i was a child of mtv so what was it for you we're about the same age yeah, you know, um, like I had mentioned earlier, I, I, I became an, an album credit junkie early on. 
Yeah. So I remember going through my parents' uh, vinyl and reading the liner notes. And then I remember when I first started buying records, this name kept popping up, Jeff Picaro, right? Mm. I would see him on Michael McDonald records. I saw him on a Michael Jackson record. Uh, I saw him on one of the albums I bought, uh, David Gilmore, About Face, his, one of his solo albums. Saw his name on there. And then with Toto, you know, my brother had Toto 4. And I kept seeing this this guy. And, and that was before I knew what a session player was, a session musician. Yeah. Because I just associated with him with Toto. Um, so that that was kind of uh, one of the things that... Uh, that I, I I guess inspired me and I and I really kind of latched on to him and his playing and how versatile he was, um, and then and as far as teachers were concerned, you know, the, I I had some great teachers, local teachers. Uh, one of the guys, one of my first teachers was a guy named John Dixon, who studied under Jim Petersack from Crane School of Music, up upstate New York. Uh, great. Peter Sack, you know, everyone had, had, had studied with him. Oh, he cranked out some and, good students, yeah. Oh, yeah. So John Dixon was one of his, you know, former students, and I had him from an early age, and boy, he just kicked my butt. You know, I was this young, cocky kid that could, you know, had some natural ability, and he sort of said, you know, you're a pretty good kid, but you're not all that. So uh, that, that was pretty that cocky was, too, man. You know, it's just some of this. Yeah. I think you need a little bit of that. Yeah, and then at some well, point you you just you know you realize hey man you know this is not how it works but there's that yeah. that initial kind of like i got this you know and yeah that confidence well, that we need as a drummer because we're leading and shaping the music from back there like a great conductor you know yeah, we got dude, a lot of responsibility you, yeah you you can't be timid you have to be confident and you know having a somewhat of a controlling manner back there you know we you know we not we may not own the bus but we're driving it you know? <laughs> I tell everybody that that we're not the C. We are not. Our names aren't on the marquee, but we are kind of like the CEO of the band in the sense that we're in charge of running that thing. Even though our yeah, name man. isn't on the marquee, so we have a lot of responsibility. So with that comes Heck like yeah. a lot of personal responsibility of being able to show up time and being over prepared and all that stuff that you have naturally yeah. that has given you the career that you've had. Yeah, just it all starts with us. But yeah, that's 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 a good way to put it. I always. I always uh, would think of it as, as far as a a catcher. You know, we might we we're not the pitcher. We're not the guys that are getting all the credit, but we're we're calling the signs. We're calling the shots. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. So great teachers. I'm assuming your parents were supportive of of this idea. Very much so. You know, I can still hear my dad saying, "You know, go to go to college and get your degree and teach in education. You could always, you know, you could." You have your summers off and you could play on the weekends. And then, you know, and I was always like, dad, that's great. I want to do that, but I just, I want to play. I just want to play. Yeah. You know, you know, and if that I was, can't be good, then I just don't want to do it. You know, we've got to be good. Gotta that was real incredible. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the, that was the, you know, our friend Greg Bissonette, that was his story where his dad was like, you know, you got the summers off and it's a great thing to fall back on. You're going to learn yeah. things in the process, you know, get your music education degree. So did you finish? Did you get the degree? No. Or, so what no, was it? A couple, a couple of years, a couple of years. Yeah, it was just, it was just a, a year and a half. And then I just went, uh, studied with like te teachers. I would s uh, seek out certain teachers in, in the area. There was another guy that I, I would go see play all the time in uh, Florida, a guy named Dave Hanlon. We used to be in a band, uh, Duke, Duke Jupiter, and he was a great jazz player. And so I used to go show up. I was I wasn't even old enough to get into these clubs, so I would show up and I would I would uh, help unload his drums and, and and get him in there. And then you know he would say to the, the club owner, "It's like yeah, he's cool. He's with me." You know, so I could watch. I could watch him play and do his thing. There was another great guy named Willie Fletcher who played with McCoy Tyner and oh, wow. uh, who else? McCoy Tyner and uh, Roberta Flack. And uh, Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Petrucciani, great jazz drummer. And I followed him around, man, for months, begging him to, like, let me take lessons. And finally, I annoyed him enough where he would just say, listen, if you come to one of my lessons and you don't do what I tell you to do, then this relationship is over, you know. But if you stop bothering me, I'll give you a lesson. So, I love that tough love. You know, it's like yeah. you better be prepared for your lessons or I'm dropping you like a hot rock. Yeah. And it was, man, about 18 months I studied with him and it was just amazing.
I mean, he he was a burner, man. Great drum. Awesome. So you did all the right things. You got your hands together. You got your reading together. You got your styles together. You're mm-hmm. in Syracuse. Oh, love the chicken riggies. Love the food. Love the culture. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, they and they make a lot of great drummers in that area of the country. The, uh, the guy named Steve Gadd, Rochester. Uh, yeah, hello. But then wh- what was the decision to get to Florida? Was it a band that took you there? You're like, I'm moving for the weather. I need some vitamin yeah, D. Yeah, it was like that. Uh, my brother bought a summer home down there. And uh, so I helped him move down. Uh, I can't remember. It was in the wintertime. So I helped him move down to his place just to check it out and to, to close on it. And it was only going to be a summer place for him. So so he was down there for about a month, came back home. And I was like, so do you need somebody to live at your place when you're not there? <laughs> it's like, yeah, if you want to go down and pay the rent. I'm like, yeah, dude. So I did. I, you know, I was 20, 21 years old. Uh, I had no ties. Why the heck wouldn't I, you know, and the, and the weather was beautiful and there was, you know, beautiful people on the beach all the time. Oh, yeah. Not much clothing. And, <laughs> and there was a scene. There was a there was a music scene that like, you know, you could play seven days a week still like you couldn't do that still in Syracuse that that had, had definitely dissolved. But down in Florida, because it was touristy, you know, there were a lot more opportunities to play. And that's what I needed to do. I just needed to play. No, yeah, you, you know? got to you get. I, I'm sure you subscribe to the ten thousand hours theory, which if yeah. you want to be an a, incredible, it's something you got to put in the grunt work. Um, and you know, it's interesting, and it's a it's a topic that is very hot, of course, on a lot of drum forums and on social media right now. It's causing some some interesting back and forth between people. But the ten thousand hours that you got was, yeah, you got your reading, you got your tiles together, and then you wanted to apply it with real people in the room, getting yelled at. You're too fast. You're too yeah. slow. You're too loud. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I got that one a lot. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and so that that is that education is priceless. I think, yes, that, it's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's you have to go back and consider all the great pieces of music that inspired us to want to play. They were sessions that were done with human beings. Okay. People were playing and tracking live together yes. sometime without a click. Yeah. And then all of the great live records that we grew up listening to, you know, Peter Frampton comes alive. You've had, you had uh, Bob Seger and the, the silver bullet band. Yeah. You, know, you had pink Floyd's live stuff. Those were human beings playing together. And I think it's wonderful that there's so many great resources for these young people to be able to become the practice room monsters. But it, it's really about the human communication and, and the, the human element of being able to share with another person uh, what you're doing. And that inspires somebody else to play a certain thing. And then what you do inspires somebody else to play a certain thing. Yeah. You know, that's, that's paramount. And you know that from doing sessions here in town. Well, let's we say, we, it's under, a, we yeah. understand that. That's, that's what live tracking does. Mm-hmm. That's why, that's why some of those brilliant pieces of work were so brilliant. You know, the stuff that Liberty DeVito did with Billy Joel. Those guys tracked together, man. They oh, God. Big shot. Oh. oh, my gosh, dude. They, I mean, that all came together because there were human beings discussing parts and playing off of each other. And they just, they just tuned in the lib. They went back there and they, they oh. gassed up their engines and they got Dude. their energy from him and all the eye. Everything was so musical. and Huge, man. Just huge. Just huge, man. It's got, the guy's so intense, man. And he's, it's all heart. He's just a, you know, oh, yeah. he's, he's just a softie. Just, I mean, lib's oh, a softie, yeah. but if you cross him, like he can whip out the, you're, I'm not going to take that shit. You no, know? he's a New York Italian, baby. You know? <laughs> If he doesn't take you out, he'll find somebody that can. I'm oh, sure yeah. He knows. He's oh, got a Rolodex God. of people who call. Yeah, yeah. You know? He's the back guy. He's the knife guy. He's the. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, I hope he listens to this. Oh, my God. That's funny. Um, uh, so you did the work, you know, and I watch a lot of your videos and, and I, you know, it's so funny. I can hear little bits of, uh, of the Jeff Picaro thing just because, you know, great composers borrow, but you know, good composers borrow, but the great composers, they steal, right? So you steal and then it's mm-hmm. either through playing along or 
uh, extreme listening and or transcribing, you get that person's essence, their heart, their musical yeah. choices, their fills into your DNA, and it might. It's always going to manifest in a different way. Like anybody that knows my playing knows that I loved Alex Van Halen. I loved. Um, I loved. Uh, I loved Kenny. I love those choices. I love. Yeah. You know the big beat drummers, the Max Weinbergs, the Ringos, yeah. and I just stole and stole and stole and stole, man. Yeah, um, of course, and that's but, how we learn. That's but you always sound like yourself. Styles. You know, well, that's great. And I really appreciate that because, you know, for the longest time, you know, I wanted to be Jeff. I wanted to be one of the Murata brothers. I wanted to be Mono Cache. I wanted to be Stuart Copeland. Oh, but, that stuff's all in there, man. Well, but, you know, you know, as well as I do, we will never sound like them because we are not them. But yeah. what we can do is we can take, the, like you said, the essence of their playing and allow that to filter into how we play and that manifests into us having our own style. I play like me. I have elements of all those guys, but I, I just, I sound like me because, you know, there's only one David to, Northrup. Yeah. Well, you get to this point in your, in, in your career and you get to a certain age, you just think, well, you know, I guess either I'm going to be okay with it or I'm not. <laughs> yeah. You know? And and I'm still being hired. So I guess it's cool. I guess it's working. Oh yeah. You know? Getting getting hired left and right. And I, when I moved to town, I, like I said, I moved to town on a Tuesday and I had a first, my first job was on Saturday, but it wasn't a dream job. It was with a society band, you know, wearing a tuxedo. And then mm -hmm. I would just literally during the days, I would just play along to Eddie Bear's recordings, Lonnie Wilson recordings, Chad Cromwell, Greg Morrow. And I was just mm. stealing their stuff. I was like, you know, if I'm going to work in this town, I've got to play like these guys mm. and and i don't know if that was true like i got you know eddie and lonnie were very nice they they hooked me up with work you know they probably you know threw some yeah, stuff okay. your way you know because they're Great super time. they're super nice guys um but when i finally got to the point where i was like i am just going to be my own man and if it takes five years longer so be it mm -hmm. well, and good it, for you. that was the thing that that's put it over the top it worked you guys created a sound for your artist yeah i mean jason aldean is jason aldean but you know the people in town that know you guys know that that sound is responsible for you three guys i mean you guys you guys created a thing you know no, and that's right we'll, we'll, we'll take you, it that's, <laughs> yeah but, but that's but that's great dude that's that's something to be really proud of well, you know, you. not everybody can say that you know and that's why he sounds like him he doesn't sound like uh, a, a bunch of session guys he has a sound yeah you know and i think if more artists got hip to that you know there's a chemistry that takes place uh outside of just the session guys that get called if you have a unit of people that really know how to play well together you know that's something special and you know not not to take anything away from the session guys that do get called obviously those units of guys that play together all the time have a chemistry that's why they get called for sure you yeah know, like greg morrow and michael rhodes and you know oh you know there's there's a few numbers of combinations you know what do you want to sound like yeah. you want glenn wharf today with eddie bears or what, who do you want yeah you know and I think there's a list of about, you know, I would, some would say five, but, you know, if you go over to Drum Paradise and you look at all the drums that are parked over there and you've got, you know, my drums are there and, you and you know, there's Seth Roush and there's Eddie and there's Lonnie and there's Chad and there's, um, yeah, there's Shannon and there's uh, Chris McHugh and Jerry Rowe and Miles McPherson. So that right there is 10 guys. Mm -hmm. So if you take the top 10 bass players, the top 10 guitar players, so there's probably about, you know, it's a Baskin Robbins. Thing. If you take those 10 guys on each instrument, you start creating different combinations. They're all going to be able to swim with each other. You absolutely. Know? Absolutely. You know? And there's, you know, and, and, and there are some, I guess, some different uh, end components, I guess, that you could get out of mixing and matching, you know, which yeah. is kind of interesting. But uh, what you guys did was something from the outside, which I'm always the guy that likes the underdog. You know, and I know you will agree with me on this. I remember when I moved to town, uh, Tommy Wells was really instrumental in, in giving me great advice. And one of the things he said was, you'll never break into somebody else's click. You got to form your own clicks. Yeah. And those clicks will move and progress together. You know, you have a batch of guys that you move to town with and you become comfortable with them and you scratch each other's back and you throw work to. And within that, you establish that, that relationship and that chemistry and you sort of make the pro progress. You make you climb the, the hill together. 
I agree. And, and you, you guys did. Well, yeah. you know, and I appreciate it. And like, I'm, you know, I, I was looking at some of these videos. If you go to drummerworld.com and look up your name or you go to uh, your YouTube channel, uh, what is it, David Northrup Drums on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Is yep. that right? Um, I, I see some of these familiar faces from two decades ago from my early national journey, guys like Scotty Simpson and Kevin Ray and Kevin Adams. And I don't know what happened to Shane Sutton. Is he around? Yeah, um, he's still playing. Yeah. So, but you know, so, so I would go to jam sessions and do early gigs with these guys. I was even, I was even in Pam Tillis's band yeah. uh, with Kevin Adams. Yep. And then, you know, just time goes by and you get pulled in a different, I haven't seen these guys forever, but you're, you're running a, that they're part, it's part of your story as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We still play together. Yeah, and Randy please Smith. say my the best Randy. Oh my God, the Big Bear. Yeah, uh, Bear, yeah he's amazing. Oh yeah, dude. We, uh, he, gosh, I met him probably within the first two three months. I moved to town at the Sixteenth Avenue Cafe Jam. Remember that? Oh my God! And then it became a shoe store, and now it is something else. I th yeah, I don't even know if it's there. I think it, I think it might have became uh, a parking lot. That Irish, <laughs> yeah, a parking lot. Probably so. Yeah. Yeah, man, that that was a, that was a great time, man, because there was a lot of, uh, you know, the town seemed like it was smaller and it was really just really exciting. And I don't know if it's because we were all new, but there was just there was just a different buzz. It's Nashville still great, yeah, but there was just a lot more jams going on and and guys more worried about you know uh, making those relationships as opposed to just playing downtown you know making yeah. making a buck which is all part of the process it's all part of the you know the tutelage that you have to have but yeah it was it was cool we were lucky man we had a and the session thing was still happening dude man yeah i mean yeah. like you know I, we don't want to discourage people like sessions are happening in nashville but some of the parts of the industry have disappeared like for example I know that there's some guys that'll put together these wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, demo sessions where they're like, hey, man, we're going to do like two songs an hour, dude, strict, every mm -hmm. 30 minutes, we are, you know, and it's just bam, it's like a factory. But for the most part, you know, the tools of entry are very affordable, and you got the kids that are writing songs, and they've just graduated from UNT or University of Miami or Berkeley, and they've got an Akai trigger pad and some nice samples in mm -hmm. Pro Tools or Logic, and, and they can create yeah. a really amazing demo almost with all virtual instruments. So, like, that part of the industry is kind of like, ah, disappeared you know what i mean and now yeah. we've got like the uh well demo accounts or like the uh publishing accounts i used to have a bunch of publishing accounts where right. you know that that was the majority of what i was doing that and like you know low budget uh demo sessions or custom projects which some of those still happen but as you said a lot of that takes place now at, at the home you know i mean right. i have a session i'm doing six songs for a guy uh great account i've done three records for this guy a uh, gentleman named mike mccarroll songwriter out of atlanta yeah and uh, I've, I've got a, a tracking session i'm doing for him uh thursday so if you guys are listening to this audio uh and not the video uh dave is in his drum space and there's a wall of cds this guy loves cds and records and albums mm. and he loves reading, reading now those drums behind you are they all mic'd up is that, are you in your tracking space yeah. Okay, yeah, great. I have I have two I have two different kits set up. So you know, depending on what I'm doing, I can uh, unplug one snake and plug the other snake in. I've got you know one a big rock set up with a 24. Yeah, and then I've got a you know a, a kit that has more toms. You know, so I can do whatever what, it's called. What does your bride do on tracking day? Up, oh, I'm going to the mall today, or I'm going to go work in the yard, like on because it's like the house is just rumbling with drums. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm lucky because you know everybody has jobs. Everybody goes to work. And I oh, I love to, that. Yeah, so I could just come down into the uh, the drum, the drum studio or the gr uh, groove garage, I call it, in <laughs> pajamas, cut a few tracks, and you know, have some coffee. I love it. Yeah. And then, so um, I, you know, I do a similar thing. I did a thing for a guy yesterday, and Johnny comes over and helps me, you know, get out of my head. You know, I love guys like yourself and other guys I know who can do everything themselves. But if if you just lock me in a room, I just feel like you go down the rabbit hole, and you're like, "Is that the right snare? Is it spongy enough? Ah, did I play too much?" So it's almost like when you have an engineer with you, and then the client is on FaceTime. It's you get walked off the ledge with another. Yeah, person, absolutely. You know, and just, well, I I have a guy like that too. There's a guy around the corner from me that I track at his place quite a bit. Yeah. A guy named Steve Cummings, who's a great drummer. Steve Cummings, oh my God. When I, we yeah. met him in night I met him in ninety seven. Give him my yeah. best, man. Yeah, he was uh he had the house gig at Barbers for the longest time. He did. Yeah, so he is a great engineer and a great drummer. So a lot of times I'll go over with larger budget situations I can afford an engineer. 
uh, which, and, you know, it's always worth it because he's got some, such, you know, great outboard gear. So I'll go over there. So that that is a big deal for me yeah. to be able to have that as a resource just down the road for me. And same thing, you know, him being a drummer, I could say, how's that snare sound? Or what do you think of that track? You know, he's honest. Like, yeah, I mean, you probably could do another one. You probably should do another one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, I love it's, it, man. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's great because, you know, who better to know than another drummer? You know? Totally. Okay, so we talked about recording a lot. You know, you, you know you've got the... Um uh, the setup, like it's in a modern expectation for a drummer to have a setup all mic'd up, ready to go. But let's talk about some of these, you know, credits. I mentioned uh, we shared Joel Sonier, we shared Gene Watson, we shared Pam Tillis, we shared Rick Orozco, Rebecca Lynn Howard, Lila McCann, all friends. So we shared yeah. a lo- we shared a lot of jobs. Um, the big ones I see here, you know, that took up a lot of your time is you were on there multi years. Were like Travis Tritt. Boz, Joe Nichols, maybe Winona. Tell, give us the leg. Like, how did it all start for you? What was one of the first gigs? Because Travis Tritt is like really like a big marquee credit for you. You were there for what sure. five five years or so? Nine nine years. Nine years. That's great. Nine years. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah, us about so some that, of the stuff that came about. Uh, well, you know what? It's interesting. You know, um, let me preface this by saying. There were a lot of no's before I got a yes. There was a lot of auditions that I I was I failed. Fifteen guys went to the audition, fourteen didn't get the job. One guy did, and you and I auditioned for Pam Tillis together. Oh that my god! Same, yeah, oh. and uh, that same year I auditioned for Trisha Yearwood, and I auditioned for another new country artist who's non-existent anymore. Isn't that crazy but, how they can come and go? Yeah. Whoa. So as a result of not getting the gig with Pam, not getting the gig with, with Trisha, I took a gig. I didn't even audition. I was just given the opportunity to play with Rebecca Lynn Howard. Yeah. And, and her bass player was a great guy named Brian Henchcliffe. Yes. Brian knew Travis Tritt's management because he used to play with Michael Peterson. Michael Peterson and Travis Tritt were both with the same management company. Yeah. Falcon Goodman. So that connection took place by me just sort of accepting a low end gig. You know, I was just like, I didn't get the Trisha gig, which was one of those gigs I really wanted because I loved her music. So Brian said, Hey man, you know, I think you would probably be a good fit. Would you be interested in auditioning? I'm like, yeah, you know, sure. If it happens, great. Let's do it. Uh, didn't expect anything. Finally got a call from, from, Travis's manager and ironically his uh, Travis's manager a guy named Gary Falcon was a West Coast guy from from San Francisco he knew of this guy I played with Les Dudek who's not a really you know if you're a musician you know who he is yeah he actually was a fan so that actually was kind of a cool thing for him to recognize and I was given the opportunity to audition through Brian's recommendation and you know, got the gig and the gig lasted for, for nine years. Oh, it's uh, something it's yeah. so nice to be gainfully employed in this crazy business where you No, Yeah. And it was like overnight. I went from like not having a gig to all of a sudden playing for this established superstar, you know, and that really warranted my ability. You know, I was justified then. you know how it is. We're all trying to prove ourselves. And then finally, when we get to that point where, we we i guess we win we 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 win the opportunity to work with somebody you all that hard work is justified yeah you know you know because we're 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 just we're all unsure this is this is the arts you know um some people might dig what you do some people might not so you don't really know how to gauge you know especially when you leave an audition and you don't get the call yeah you know i mean auditions are really really yeah, hard you know and if and if if someone's an actor they know that even more than anyone because actors probably audition at 500 percent more than musicians do they sure. they do yeah. 80 or 100 auditions a year minimum 
Um, and it always rubbed me there because I would leave auditions and go, well, what the heck? I was so prepared. I learned all five of, forget the five songs. I learned all five of her records. What was it? Did I wear yeah. the wrong shirt? What? Ha- but yeah. it's, it's just doesn't mean you're, you're not a, a, a good drummer or a good musician or that you deserve to have a good job. It's just that, are you the right cast? Are you, are you yeah, going to be man. cast correctly for this person and the culture of the band? Like when I auditioned yeah, exactly. for Trisha, she probably said to herself, this guy is a spaz. I do not <laughs> want this yeah. guy on my bus, right? Yeah, he, he makes a cup of coffee nervous. Oh my god! Right here, <laughs> I know. We'll see. And 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 I, and I feel like that maybe that was the case with me too because I was a little bit, you know, you're New York. You got New York. Aggra- yeah. aggra- my personality is just a little bit more outgoing and forthcoming, and you know, I'm I'm going to talk to somebody. Yeah, you know, I'm going to go up and talk. I, I don't have a problem with that. And. And maybe she just, maybe that made her uncomfortable. Who knows? Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, but that's just, and, and that's so true. You know, you play two hours of the night, maybe, and then you have to live with these people 22 hours on the bus. Yeah. So personality is, is, is really an important factor that, that goes in with winning that opportunity. You know? Yeah, and man. One of, one of the great things, it, you know, I know you have a lot of young people that, that listen to this, uh, which is great. One of the things that you have to be very self-aware of is not having a situation break your spirit. You know, you have to be very careful about the failures that take place in your career along the way, learn from them, but don't, don't allow those failures to define you or break your spirit. You know, gotta be, you gotta continue to be positive. You have to keep moving forward to improve yourself. And the only way you can improve yourself is when you have failures. You know? Vig- vigilance, vigilance, and polite persistence. And I mean, that is, yeah. you know, that is your story because you were gainfully employed with Travis, you know, and I remember that era. And then you were still doing, uh, you know, you might teach a little bit here and there. You're developing your clinic career. You are working on your sessions. You'd go out on the weekend with someone else and fill in with Heck somebody. Yeah. You know, you learn from that experience. You make a little bit extra cash. Your life gets richer. Your bank account gets richer. There's mm-hmm. no reason to not do the work if you Absolutely. can. And, and you always did that, man. And then uh, what else do I see on here? Your one of your most recent gigs, and you, I believe you're still there, is Joe Nichols. Yeah, yeah, man. I I'm starting my second year with him. We start rehearsals next week when it's really exciting, man. It's, uh, he's, uh, he's sort of having a resurgence. He's got a new album out. That's, you know, got a single in the top 20. He's kicking butt, you know, and he's such a great dude, man. You know, when you find, uh, you know, you've been in the same camp for a long time and I was in the same camp with Travis for a while. And then the Oak Ridge boys. And, you know, when you, when you find a place that you have camaraderie, you know, those people become your family. Oh yeah, you know, and when you come in and out of certain gigs a lot, and especially when you're being a sub drummer or just kind of filling in or just a transition drummer, if you will, you know, till they find somebody that they can afford, maybe you know, if if you are pricing yourself out of the gig or just you would just require a little bit more than they can, yeah, you know, they can they can do. Um, when you find a place that clicks man it's exciting you know and i can appreciate that because i've had i've had a few gigs where i had that so i'm excited to be back again i found another home you know and such a great dude man it's so cool to have a boss that you just you know you love because he's a cool cat man and the band got a killer band Seems you like know. it. Uh, see, I, yeah, I've never. I don't know if I've ever met Joe. I know I've been around him, but he's got a good manager. We know his manager. <laughs> yeah, he's a good cat man. And now he loves you, dude. Oh, Boy, he had some. Yeah, he loves you, cats. Well, we've he shared said, some, yeah. some time together in the trenches, you know. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Um, but yeah, so you know, Joe. Joe's a cool, cool, a real cool thing, and I'm excited about you know being out there again with him. And it's one of those situations where. We're not so busy that I can't do other things, which you know how that is being drummers. Yeah. You know, I, I like playing other styles of music. I like being able to have, you know, the opportunity to do clinics just to kind of mix things up. Uh, I like being able to do sessions. You know, I like to be able to teach. You yeah. Know, and, and if you are in a situation where it's all consuming, sometimes that can be a little overbearing. You know, it's great oh, to yeah. be working, you know, never, never want to discount that. It's always wonderful to have a lot of opportunity to be behind your kit. But, you know, I've always been the guy that chases the other versatile opportunities. You know, I want to yeah. play a fusion gig. I want to play a blues gig. 
you know i want to do some stuff that i don't do really well yes no i love it and and tell us about tell us about you um developing your clinician career because there's a lot of videos at drummerworld.com and at your youtube channel of you doing drum clinics which is like very very exciting playing along the tracks and the tracks aren't all country Mm -hmm. they're like you got things in three four and six eight and per carl shuffle vibes and like new orleanian Mm -hmm. things it's all really great stuff so uh, when did you start doing that uh probably around 2002 um yeah. i sort of got 20 into years it. man yeah i got into it backwards and you know who really helped me kind of navigate through the whole the clinic thing was jules thomas yeah. from DW. yeah yeah so you know she's sort of kind of gave me the gist of how these things work and and how you kind of book a clinic and the fact that you really can't like call me two days before you go into a high school and say hey i'm gonna do this clinic can i get some support she's yeah. like can't do that i need we 30 need least- days yeah exactly i need 30 days we need to prepare for it. we need to like you know have a social media blast if we're really going to do this and get the benefit on our end you know you got to give us some 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 lead time so she was very very cool about kind of teaching me what is required and how to how to do the whole thing and and i did it man you know i always loved going to drum clinics and i always wanted to be able to share my experiences and share some of the things that i wish i would have heard from clinics that i went to yeah you know i went i went to the ones that like were you know you became awestruck by this guy's chops and you thought i probably should just quit playing drums because i can't do that yeah. You know, which is not not the case. You know, that's maybe 5% of the, uh, the a small percentage of what the drum roll or the, the, the drum position requires. Not everybody's going to have the gig with Chick Corea or John McLaughlin. Or, you know, or right? asked to ever be a drum, do a drum solo. You know, no, exactly. That's the last thing on their mind. And that, that was one of the things that I wanted to impress upon young players. Like, listen, man, these are the real fundamental things that you need to work on if you just want to play. Because that's what we want to do as drummers. We just want to play, you know. Why would you spend four hours working on a solo when the majority of what you need to work on is being able to groove and support the people that you're playing with? Not only the singer, but how is it that you want to dig in with the bass player? What do you want to listen for? You know, when you're listening to uh, the phrasing of a vocalist, how does that dictate to your kick drum pattern? Well, it's very significant. Very. You know, all these small little details that you know we take for granted because we've been doing this for such a long time that I didn't know about until I moved to town. You know, song uh, song form. You know, and all those very very important minute details that are significant and really make a huge impression on the opportunities that we have to get a gig and to keep a gig yeah you know? man well you yeah. do a good job with it i, I you know I, I it's and what i love about uh, your playing is that there's always i mean you have there is fire and you have tons of dynamic control but you're not a ba- you don't bash i mean you play with smaller sticks and yeah, there's and there's a there's a lot of subtlety and control and yeah. dynamics and um i love seeing that it's it's, well, it's, it's really you. great yeah man yeah. Well, you got you got your thing, man. You got the uh, and you know, uh, volume is not energy. You know, yeah. volume is is great for punctuation and to be able to drive a band. But you know, the real thing comes down to, you know, the groove. Yeah. And 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 the motion and the momentum that we're giving and and the inf- the infectiousness of that uh, you know Spirit. that rhythm. Yeah. yeah man. You know. Well, and the disease is when you play softer for the young kids there's a tendency to drag so there's Mm -hmm. almost like the the focus and the focus and the intention of the time the feel the placement of everything is even more important when you're playing softer like at a wedding if you got to play the macarena or some miley cyrus song at like a mezza piano because the mother of the bride is yelling at you 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 still have to be able to lead (laughs) that band at that volume You know. You're right. You're right, man. And, and, and you know, in all honesty, to me, it's always been, excuse me, more challenging to play quiet. Yeah. You know. You know. Um, and to have that control and to be able to have that that drive and that that ability to kind of inspire the players that you're playing with, even at a smaller or a, at a lower 
uh, volume. It's very challenging. Yeah, you know? man. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's something I don't want to not have in this interview, and that is you mentioned earlier about your relationship with this gentleman, Les Dudek. Now, he was a sideman guitar player with like Cher and um, Stevie Nicks, but he would always put out his own solo mm. records. And on one of his solo records, yeah. I believe it was in, oh, I forget the year, you'll tell me, but he had the great uh, Jeff Percaro on some of the tracks, and mm -hmm. you ended up on this record. Yeah. Tell us that story. Yeah. Dude, it was just, you know, I guess the older I get, the more insane it it it, uh, uh, it, it becomes. You know, I, I was living in the middle of uh, Central Florida, really nowhere Florida, a place called Lakeland. Lakeland is between Tampa and Orlando. Yeah. Um, and I was playing with this uh, blues artist named James Peterson. And James would use me on weekend gigs, uh, the more important gigs. And then during the week, he would hire guys that just were sort of local dudes that would come play for 20 bucks and maybe a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Even so, then you were like, no. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, they were playing in Lakeland and the keyboard player that, was also playing with James said, Hey man, you know, we're going to be using this guy on drums tonight. I have no idea how he's going to do. Why don't you come out and maybe sit in? And if things go awry, at least we know you have, we have you as a backup. So I'm like, all right, that, no problem. So I went out and Les Dudek happened to be there that night. And he sat in and I sat in and we sort of hit it off playing wise and i knew of him but i didn't really know everything that he had done um i knew he played with Cher and he played with boss gags and, oh, yeah. and steve miller and i know he had played on these on on their albums but i had no idea he had a solo career so we went to the bar and hung out and basically drank and closed the bar and he said he had mentioned that he had this solo project that he had started in 91 wow and that he never finished it because he got called out to go on the road with Stevie Nicks. So by the time he got back from that tour to finish the record, Jeff Picaro had passed away. Mm. And uh, so he had said to me, he's like, uh, you know, you, you kind of have some similarities with the drummer that played on the record. And, you know, I kind of like that. Uh, but the guy that started the record and passed away was a good friend of mine. And at this point, I had no idea it was Jeff Picaro. So I was, I was like, wow, man, that's, that's really sad. And uh, he you know, said, would you be interested in maybe doing the title track? That's all I have left. And, you know, I'm 24 years old, and here's this seasoned professional asking me about a tracking session. So I'm trying to be cool, not saying, yeah, man, I'll do it. Yeah, sure. I'll show, <laughs> what do you want? I'll, I'll, can I, I'll set up tonight. Let's do it tonight. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to be cool. And, and I said, you know, man, I'm really sorry about your friend, by the way, who was, who was your, your buddy? It was a guy named Jeff Picaro. And I was like, what? Yeah. I mean, Jeff Picaro was my hero, you know? So we ended the conversation. He said, you know, I'm going to talk to uh, my executive producer and see if we can book the date. So this is before cell phones and everything, anything, right. You know, I, I, I had, uh, uh, a landline with an answering machine and, and basically just every time I would come back to my house when I was running with my roommates, I'd be checking the phone, checking the answer machine, checking the answer machine. Finally, I get this call. I say, like, Hey, Northrop, this is Dudek. We got a green light. We're going to do the session on this date in Orlando at this studio. Let me know if you can do it. I'm like, wow, this is really going to happen. So long or the short of it, I, I went in and I played on the title cut. Uh, of his album, it's called Deeper Shades, yeah, Deeper man. Shades of Blue. Great job. Um, and uh, you know, I became friends with him. I, I was hanging out with this guy and Les Dudek, and I learned so much from him and all the things he had done. And his previous records, like you know, the first album that he put out, uh, Boz Skaggs actually produced that record, and David Hungate played dr uh, bass on it, and Carl played drums on it. Yeah. So you know. So I, I really got a chance to go back in time with him and learn all the stuff that he had done and learned a lot of the things that he did that he probably shouldn't have done that had some detriment to his career. Huh. But one of the really exciting things about working on that record was I was able to go into the studio and while they were mixing, you know, they would bring up the drum tracks and it was just 
Jeff's drums and him. And so they would play the tracks and they would be EQing some of the stuff. And at the end of the track, you could hear him breathe and set his sticks down and say, you know, you could hear him talk like, yeah, that was a good one. Let's go check it out. So he, this was 1993. It was like a year after he passed. Yeah. And like, I'm in this, I'm in this control room, like probably the first time I was ever in a really proper studio. And there's these huge monitor speakers and I'm hearing Jeff Picaro. It's like a ghost. Yeah. It's incredible, dude. It was really, really, it was a, it was a God thing. You know, all of a sudden it's like, oh my, all, you know, I'm playing my first proper album credit was with my hero who passed away. Yeah. You know, it's like, how does that happen? So that was cool. And that, that kind of, op that opened some doors when I moved to Nashville, you know, you know, getting some sessions. Well, and know. also Travis's guy was, you know, a manager yeah. was in, into that thing and you were able to, and yeah. you never know the little commonality, little personal thing that's going to push it over the top. That makes someone comfortable with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. It's incredible. So that was, a, that was, that was a real special, special thing. Very, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a career milestone and a great, great story. Um, you know, the thing about Jeff is so when you think about it, he died at 38 years old with an amazing body of work. He started so young, I believe, at 15 or 16. Uh, Crazy, yeah. Professional jobs. So, you know, he had, a, a, I guess, a 22-year run there or something, and that body of yeah. work, he's still so young when he passed. God rest his soul. Yeah. Staggering, staggering. Yeah. yeah, you just can't imagine what he probably could have done or continued to do you know it's it's tragedy and it's 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 a most you know tragic that he had you know he had a family he had young kids that yeah unfortunately grew up without a father uh but yeah you know what an inspiration how blessed we are to have had such a guy that inspired so many and still inspires so many i mean it's just legendary and his body of work you know speaks for itself you know he yeah. was huge huge impact on my on my career and my playing you know Oh, yeah, just certain certain individuals just resonate with us. Whether you know, it could be as something as like that. That dude wears the coolest glasses, and then you check out, and you're like, "Oh my god, the drumming!" And then it's just it, it inspires yeah. you for decades at a time, man. Sure, man, Kenny Arnold. There you go, man. I know yeah. people are like, I hear that in there, you know. So you gotta, yeah, you gotta tip your hat to the guys, man. You yeah, know? dude, and we're so fortunate that we grew up in an era where there was so much of that. So there was some great playing. You know, we grew up in the 80s and in, in the 90s where you had to play. Whether you like them or not, Duran Duran. That band tracked together, dude. They all yeah. played on the records. Hungry they like the great. wolf, dude. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the band. You know, in Excess, another, another band. Yeah. You know, you could, I mean, and, and there are examples of, of certain bands that had ghost guys come in and play, you know, Anton Fig would kiss and, and you know, a, a few other uh, thing, you know, other people. But for the most part, you had to play, man. You know, yeah. there were no pro tools. You couldn't slide stuff around, you know. Yeah, you can no. cut cut a lot of tape, but that wasn't acceptable. You had to get the track, man. You had to I, play. And, I, and still to this day, I have a mentality where it's like I do not want to. I I don't want to do sections. Like no. a lot of producers do, like to do sections. It's the new thing. It's all the yeah, rage. Where it's that. like you know the shaker and the tambourine, the MIDI tambourine are like slammed to the grid, and then they want to take take it section by section. That is starting to happen more and more. But there's something that this pride that I have that is associated with chamber mm. music, classical music, big band jazz, where it's like, we are going to do this from the top and we're going to get a full take. And if we yeah. have to punch, we'll save the day. That's my favorite. If we can just go from top to bottom. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that was the, the milestone. That's what we were taught to be able to do. Be a one take guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and that's one of the things that, uh, was was definitely significant and was pressed upon me when I was doing those publishing accounts or doing those, you know, bash for cash. You know, you got 12 songs, you're going to get them done in, you know, three sessions or two sessions. You know, you got one pass. You might run the track down halfway through just to get the arrangement. And then they want to roll tape. They don't want well, to punch. I know. It's like, wait, 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 wait. And I, we've done that before too, where it's like you, you get, you play it and you maybe get to the second chorus. Right. And they say, okay, we got it guys. Let's, let's go for one. What about and the ending? What about the bridge? <laughs> well, I say, yeah. guys, so there's no surprises and we don't, have to do this again let's just discuss the bridge am i going to the bell or am i going to the yeah, on the know. toms and then what's the ending are, what's are we fading no one fades anymore so what's no. the ending is it batman is it rest man is it bop bop yeah. bop what, what's it gonna be yeah 
Yeah, exactly. And you'd be like, man, come on. Let's just just someone talk to me for another three or four seconds and it'll, then roll tape. It'll be all yeah. the difference. Yeah. yeah. All the difference. And when you listen yeah. to Gad, like Gad wouldn't touch touch his drums. He would totally figure out everything he wanted to do knew the knew the arrangement and then when he got behind the drums watch out there's your solo section on asia that was one take yeah i know dude how how incredible i mean how incredible oh man yeah the, the best yeah the, i know the best man yeah. Yeah, I think I, I someone told me that he got up off the drums and said, "Yeah, I think there's something there you could keep." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think so, baby. So, what yeah. about uh, what? Tell you know, it seems like another um, you know marquee job for you. I'm sure that there's a, some incredible experiences that came out of it. Was uh, was working with Boss Gags because yeah. you had you yeah. had you got to do your hero's drum parts every night. Was he pretty specific? Like, hey, man, we you know, low down. <laughs> I, I better have yeah. I guess kadoom yeah he was you know boz was very particular um he was not abusive but he was uh he was intense you know sometimes he might not know what he wanted but he did know what he didn't want <laughs> that's and, a good quote right there you know so when that took place in in, in in the the cool thing was having been there for a few months it wasn't just the drum chair although the drum chair was the hot seat Everybody had their day at soundcheck, you know, and you didn't want to be the one that started to become micromanaged because once he was focused on you, it was going to be your day, you know? That's a weird thing with artists. I don't know why they go down that rabbit hole where they're just like, no. I have to pick on someone today. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't think it was a malicious thing. And the thing that I, I came to grips with was, you know, he had Jeff Picaro, he had Carlos Vega. He had Peter Erskine. He wow. had so many great drummers. Anything after that is just kind of slumming, right? You know, you just you kind of like using some other guys, and and uh, you know, he had Michael Landau, Bob Glob. I mean, he just had so many of the greatest. Michael Picaro, Dave Page. I mean, all these guys were in his in his band. So uh, to be on that list was, you know, to to to. to Gosh, what a what an honor to to be mentioned in the in in in, in those names. But yeah, man. But but the intensity of the gig, uh, you know, it was really frustrating sometimes because uh, it's not just about knowing the parts; it's about really understanding what he needs. And um, you know, one of the things that I took away from the gig was Boz would never talk about him. He always referred to it the music. The music needs this. The music needs the dynamic here. It's not like I need. This is what the music needs. Um, and w the the volume of the stage was very, very low. Uh, so that made it incredibly challenging to be able to play some of those parts that you know in the studio. Jeff really laid into them. You know? It's hard not to play Lido Shuffle and like really dig in. Yeah. And some of the environments we played did not lend itself to being able to do that. So you had to be very aware of that. So like smaller theaters, casinos, festivals, yeah. intimate yeah, festivals. Yeah, some, well, I saw the, some of the videos and you were hitting right in the center of the snare and the, and some of the, the Tom seemed like they was, were they tuned a little lower than you usually oh, tune? Dude. Yeah, big time. And that was the other thing. It was, everything was silk degrees, everything sonically. That was the, the measure they wanted to sound like that. So I actually had to change the kind of heads I use. Um, I can't use a lot. Of, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but that was really good. And you know, the thing that I learned from that rich was, was, when I changed my what I considered my sound to contour that music, when I would change drum heads and the drums would be really open and resonant, they wouldn't sound. It wouldn't sound. It wouldn't sound correct. Right. It didn't lend itself to the music anymore. And I understood. I, I became aware that there is more than just one sound. Like, um, and sometimes. You know, you can be an artist and you can say you have a sound, but, you know, the reason why we work is because we are very, uh, uh, we're willing to be, uh, we're willing to serve other people's uh, impressions of what their music they feel should sound like. So who am I to, to say, well, no, that's not the correct way the drums are supposed to sound. Well, no, 
I'm hired by a man and I'm supposed to uh, do what I can to, to serve his music. And part of it was making sure that my instrument sounded uh, the way he wanted it to sound. Yeah. And uh, it was a great learning experience to realize that there is more than one sound that my drums can, can sound like, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that was a, that, that, that's a great thing to, to pick up. Snare drums were another thing, man. I, I went through a bunch of different snare drums to find the one that really, that, that he wanted that, that worked. And, you know, again, environments would change. So sometimes I'd have to use a noble and Cooley snare drum as opposed to a black beauty or opposed to a, you know, a, a Gretsch solid brass, you know? And so it was, it was a, 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 a wonderful learning experience, but also very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. yeah oh my god yeah sometimes people are just you know they want what they want from their music and that is the job and just being yeah being open and flexible and sounds like you that that happens so i'm looking on the left side of the page we talked about travis and joe and boz and um <clears throat> the winona gig you filled in for our buddy cactus Mosier, right yes i did yeah that was a cool but uh, interesting situation. Uh, I love Cactus. Cactus was, uh, I met him before I moved to town. And uh, of all the people that I met prior to moving to Nashville, I met him when he was playing with, uh, um, uh, what's it, what was the band he was with? Well, there was Come a girl, on, uh, it was Highway 101. Highway 101, yeah. I'm, what a great, yeah. Like California so country, yeah. His band. <laughs> yeah. So I met him, I met him at, yeah, I met him at the Florida State Fair and he actually gave me his number and said when you get to nashville call oh. and of all the people dude that said that he was the only one that returned my call he returned my call and we talked and he didn't promise me the world he just said you need to do this you need to do that you need to get out there you need to go to writer's nights you need to go to jams you need to kind of meet with producers you need to meet with session leaders these are the things that you need to do good luck let me know how it goes give me a call in six months see how you're doing oh dude what and i stayed in touch with him what a you nice know? soul. And, yeah, that's yeah, not everybody yeah. does that. And, and yeah, yeah. And he just gave me the information I need. Here, here's how to do it, run with. It. Good luck. So, you know, we had always stayed in touch and when he had his unfortunate accident, um, he just asked if I would be available to fill in for him. And I was like, My God, wow, what an honor. You know? Yeah. So it was a kind of a bittersweet situation having done the gig and and becoming close with Winona and just loving, always loving her music, but also being there as, you know, spiritual and moral support for, you know, this guy that I, I looked up to as one of my music heroes here in town that gave me such great advice and, and do whatever I could to kind of help lift him up during a, a really unfortunate Tough time situation in his, his life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he's playing his ass off again. He's back, back, back playing. Oh. But he was at he was back at it six months, dude. Yeah, I mean he was playing a solo six months after the accident on uh, White Otis, and he was killing it, dude. But the Energizer Bunny, he's like you, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Man, that's inc I love that story. What a great guy! Because I, you know, I try to I try to do that same thing. I'll meet a kid. You see the kid side stage at the festival, and he walk. Yeah. And he, you know, acts. Hey, this is my number, kid. You know, anything you need. You know, because I remember. Yeah. I remember that when you're like yeah. trying to figure it out. It's such a confusing time. Now looking, uh, looking back, uh, looking at some of these other names, man. <clears throat> Tanya Tucker. Everybody does a little time with her, and these might yeah. have been uh, short stints, or they may have been one nights, or they maybe sat in with people. But the two names that come to, to mind here, it, it says that you've got to play with John Waite and Melon Camp. Yeah, love that all that cool. music. So tell me about that. I did a sound alike for. A, uh, a dentist comp uh, a Aspen Dental. Um, they they were doing an ad campaign, a national ad campaign, and they wanted to use "When I See You Smile," the 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 bad English song. Oh yeah. So so the licensing from CBS Records was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to Ouch. use that. So they were like, "No, thank you." So they got with an ad agency. The ad ag ad agency got a hold of John and said, "You know, we'll pay you X amount of dollars if you re recreate this this song." So I knew the producer uh, that was was working with John and Allison Kraus in the studio, um, and I got a call. For, his name was Neil Capolino. It was Neil. Oh and yeah, Neil. 
Neil and I think it was Shane Terrio played guitar yeah. and uh, John Billings and then Neil Capolito played keyboards. So we really had to like nail this thing to the wall. We had to really learn learn the part uh, exactly because they wanted it to sound exactly like like the old record. So that took place. And I had a chance to work with John in the studio and actually he cut his tracks. He cut his vocal tracks the night before we actually cut our tracks. There was a keyboard part that he played along to. So there was a little bit of a discrepancy in some of his phrasing. And this ad agency was so adamant about it being exactly like the old take. And, and Neil was like, dude, the guy's like 20 years older. It's not going to be perfect. I mean, you know, you got to kind of give him some, you know, levity here yeah. some slack here yeah so he was actually in the studio when i got there when my cartridge got there and i walked in there earlier i you know i always get to sessions early unless i have something before and it was a morning session so he actually was in the studio and so was allison kraus they were hanging out nice. so I was like, hey man how's it going he goes hey man well you know good so so that was awesome because i was always a, a john Waite fan huge I was fan a, a bad English fan and 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 the babies love the babies. And Come had on. I known had I known he was would have been there, I would have been the fanboy and I would have bought my brought my LPs in, you know, to get signed. It was probably good would, you did not do that. You're right, and that and that's <laughs> I was about to say that I would I probably would would have been asked to go home. So I'll tell you something cool about that. So I do the session. It got paid really well, and it was a national ad campaign, and we did it on the card, Nashville Union, um, and. They started at the West Coast and started the ad campaign slowly across the United States. And I got some phone calls from some people that said, hey, man, I heard you on so-and-so, you know, because I had told some people, friends of mine from Los Angeles, that I had done this thing. So I, you know, took a long time for it to get to Nashville. Well, I get up one morning, <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning. My kids are still little. I get up at Saturday morning. I'm, I'm not on the road, and I'm, I'm getting their breakfast, and I come out of the out of the kitchen, I hear the ad on television, right? And all you hear is John's vocals. And right when the drums come in, the commercial ends. <laughs> There's not a lick of drums. I was like, no way. Please tell and me you I, got a copy of it for your demo, though. I did. I got the whole thing, which was Good. cool. And you can tell because there's a little bit of, a, you know, uh, he, he changed the vocals some. So you can tell it's not Dean Castronova. Uh, you know, because I did play it as close as, as I could. I mean, I really, you know, producer Neil Capolino was, was very, very stringent on me learning the parts. And we did some of the drum fills, you know, one at a time. It's like, hey, man, no, the fill's not this, you know. So that was pretty cool. And uh, having it done on art and being a national ad campaign man i made i made some good money over, over oh, yeah, the course get, of a year and a half you get the residuals get residual man. checks yeah every 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 three months you know and that that doesn't happen so much anymore you know a lot of times uh companies do a buyout you know yeah. they pay you once even for the actors it. most but, commercials now are 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 uh kind of off the card act it's it's it's, it's a non-union i mean it is a buyout yeah. Yeah, which is too bad. I remember Tommy Wells telling me this one time when uh, he did the Budweiser commercials with all the frogs. Yeah, the frogs. But yeah, he wise. he told me. He, yeah, he did. He did play the drums on those, and I told he said that his special payments, uh, his special payments check one year for those sessions was like ten grand. You know, and this was like in the nineties, ten grand thousand dollars for a special payments fund. That's a big, big chunk of change. Yeah, you could have one, bought a car back for one ad. I mean, for one account. Yeah, the one, the one that I'm super envious of, and I, I just try to figure out what that number is, is um, Greg and Matt Bissonette played on all the Friends stuff. And it's the biggest syndicated uh, television show in the world. And I think every year, just the Friends check is like over a hundred grand. Well, what about uh, uh, Rick Morata with? Uh, oh, he uh, wrote the music to everybody was loves Raymond, which is Raymond. a whole other category. That's yeah. uh, I live in the Hamptons house. I have another Dude. one, and that's yeah. that kind of money. Yeah, that, that's that's like the last session he'll ever have to do. You know, <laughs> that's, yeah. And man, I was like, I was like, wow, no way. That's so cool. You know, Incredible, one of us. Man. You know, guys. And plus, he was such a brilliant. Brilliant session musician to begin sure. with. Yeah. To be able to have that break and come up with that. Yeah. That's, yeah. Woo, that's, that's, 
Good day, good day, good ding. That's yeah, all that's, it is sometimes. And then Ray yeah, comes in yeah. and opens his mouth and says something stupid. And I love the show so much, and I see so many commonalities with like my family and that family. I named my publishing company <laughs> Everybody Loves Redmond Music instead of Everybody Loves Raymond. That's great, man. <laughs> um, That's so, cool. so tell That's us so about cool. uh, Mellencamp. What was that? Was that a, like a one-night thing? Yeah, we did the Tonight Show. Uh, so Travis's second record on CBS. So when I was with Travis, yeah. he had left. He had left Warner Brothers and start, sound, uh, signed with Sony. So his second album had a duo with John Mellencamp. It was like, uh, what say you? So, you know... Travis is a conservative and, you know, Mellencamp is definitely uh, not conservative. He's, you know, uh, uh, a Democrat. So yeah. they had this. Yeah. Yeah. He, he had this. Uh, they had this song that was uh, basically saying, hey, you can have your opinion. I can have my opinion, but we can all get along. So that was a single that was that was put out during the election time, which was pretty smart strategery for the label yeah and so when we went on leno i think it was the it was the first time we went on leno it was mellencamp and travis so that was cool because you know i i had a chance I, you know who does we grew up in the the, the 80s and 90s man i loved mellencamp yeah. brilliant writer and of course i loved kenny yeah. so i had a chance to to meet him and to work with him and and that was that was kind of interesting he, he was a definitely an Definitely a character, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that was so cool, man. You know, So, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I played, I, I did Leno with, with John Mellencamp. Holy crap. Hey, what was your uh, favorite? Um, I have a favorite dressing room slash green room, and it's Kimmel and Fallon. Like, those are the oh, most fun, you know, in your experience. Unless, did you ever beat those dressing rooms? I mean, because nah. it's like they've got nice you know food and booze and there's a well, you know a, you know a pool kimmel. table and yeah kimmel downstairs was just a big party yeah and when we did kimmel it was uh, uh the guy that played monk was on oh yeah uh, tony a uh, yeah d- yeah so he 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 did his segment then he was downstairs like just hanging out at the bar at kimmel's drinking yeah. like he drank the whole time and i didn't have the I didn't have the goal to go up and say, hey, man, you know, I didn't hey, want to Monk, did you have you have yeah. you checked the uh, the cleanliness of that glass? Yeah, because he's you know, a, such think, an OCD guy. Yeah, I know. And, you know, I think he was he was actually there promoting one of the men in black movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tony Shalhoub. So that that was pretty cool. Yeah. And downstairs, man, you know, the, the house band was hanging out down there when they weren't playing and there was a pool table. It was just like, yeah, that that was by far my favorite. Yeah, man. I haven't gotten to meet uh, Jonathan Dressel yet. That's Bernie's brother, but he's had that job for a long, long time on the drums. No kidding. Yeah. 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 I, but we have never, I've never timed it. And then every time we do Fallon, I have never met Questlove. I, we're, we're always down oh, the hall and he's always doing something and busy. I'm like, does yeah. this guy really want me to come like ask him? You know? Yeah. Does he actually exist? Yeah. <laughs> I, cra- met, crazy. I met Questlove at uh, the Jammy Awards in 2005. Yeah. I played with uh, the Disco Biscuits and Travis Tritt. And he was side stage, and and that was pretty cool. He he seemed to dig what we were doing, but yeah. he's just like a big dude, big cat. Yeah, man. Yeah. Are you doing yeah, any uh, cool. teaching? Teaching like uh, privately? I am. I have about three students that I see on, on a semi regular basis. I'll, I'll I'll see them probably twice a week playing pros. I I, I seem to work best with with. Uh, Guys that first moved to town. I have a few guys that come. I have a, a student that comes from. Uh, in fact, he's coming up from Chattanooga this weekend. He's nice. an adult player. Um, and then uh, I've I've had a few guys from Belmont that I would see maybe five or six times. You know, but I I, I do better with like a two hour setting. You know, I charge come have a consultation with me. We'll do some plan. We'll talk about what you need to expect. Um, you know, sometimes I'll go over the, the number system, a lot of different things, but, um, yeah, with the older players, I, I seem to, to do better. Plus, you know, our schedules are so erratic. I'm not yeah. home every Monday, you know? Yeah. People say, what's, have... what's your schedule? Like, I'm like, uh, name the day. It's just the yeah, wild, yeah. wild west. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Just kind of like send you a message on Instagram or Facebook for that. Yeah. Instagram and Facebook are, are definitely the best ways to, to get a hold of me for sessions and, uh, and, and, whatnot my 
my website is down under construction again. For I was a while. working on it. Nobody. You got anybody you can tell yeah, me? Yeah, you know, my website, I'm on my second website with this company. It's a Mule Town Digital, and the um, the owner of the company is Adam Silverman, and he is a, is a, a fantastic drummer. He opened up with Lauren Elena for two, on two tours of ours, and that's when I met wow. him about 12 years ago. And so he's already built, you know, my second website, So, and he understands the plight of the drummer, so I'll, I'll connect you guys. Dude, that's great. Yeah, he is a drummer, so should, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you just plugged him too, so he'll love. Heck definitely yeah, we love that. Mule Town Digital and the entire team over there. Hey, listen, Ooh. man, I I think that we really shed a, a a fun light on 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 all things. Are you into doing the fast five with me? So it's just fast five fast questions, and you just answer as fast as you can. I'll do my best, baby. I love it. Favorite food? Seafood. Any seafood, as long as it swims or crawls on the bottom of the ocean floor, you're yeah, in. Yeah, baby. Love seafood. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Your favorite drink? Uh, ooh, coffee. So oh, yeah, baby. Do, what do you do? Do you black? Do you do a flavored food like a bougie creamer? Half yeah, and half. I put so much. I put so much in my. It, it might as well be a liquid donut. You know. Oh yeah. Which one? Like a like the hazelnut. The uh, no. I use I use like a uh, uh, sugar free vanilla. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, French vanilla, and then I use heavy whipping cream, the keto thing. Oh, my thing. God, dude, it's killing it. Uh, I love it. It's yummy. That's good, yeah. Favorite color? Blue. All right. Oh, yeah, a lot of blue drums. I'm the black guy. Like, everything is, all my drums are black. Uh, favorite song? This is really hard. Or one that just uh, coming into your life and will not leave? Jeez, I don't know. That's 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 incredibly difficult. Uh, I'll have to pass on that. So many. Uh, yeah. Well, pick know. a favorite uh, t a total song. Uh, I I won't be over you or what is it? <laughs> uh, um, Pamela, Pamela. It's oh Pamela. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I thought you were so gonna say great. like Meshuggah or something. Mush What's the uh, one? Oh, the uh, uh, Meshunga. Meshunga. Yeah, yeah, man. Mashuga yeah. is uh yeah. That's that's different. Uh, and then last but not least, your favorite movie. Favorite movie, The Godfather 1 and 2. Nice. Did you see that movie about them getting it made? Miles Teller was oh, yeah. in it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, man. That timeless, timeless movies. You know, and, you know, second, I love movies, dude. So, you know, anything with uh, Gene Hackman, you nice. know, uh, anything with uh, uh, Paul Newman or Robert Redford. I love old movies, you know. Oh, but, man, our greatest American actors. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So, you know, Godfather, I don't, I don't know what to say. It's just, uh, cinematography was, was, was ahead of its time. Um, it's just incredible. Yeah. So Pe yeah. Godfather. People are thinking I'm crazy, but my favorite movie of all time is, uh, Ridley Scott's alien. Dude, that's incredible too. That, that's a first of it of its kind. Man, yeah, you know? it changed the world. You know? And the, and the James Cameron movies too, dude. I mean, gosh, think about Spielberg too, man, dude. You know, one of my uh, one of the movies that I that I watch all the time is the one with Tom Tom Hanks, uh, Bridge of Spies. I can watch that a million times. Amazing. Yeah, so do you do you collect the DVD? You all see all the CVDs, but now you have all your DVDs too. Yeah, I did for a while. Now everything's on digital. You know, because yeah. because there's no liner notes. You know, I'm a liner yeah. notes guy, man. So if if the DVDs had had more of that, then I probably would. But it takes up too much space. Oh, it does. I need, it? I, need, I need the space for my CDs. <laughs> <laughs> awesome man yeah. this is so fun to, to catch up man and i'm just uh yeah, you know just just want to just congratulate you on, on a life and drums and somehow you know 20 something years have gone by but we are still in it and still fired up i think it's a great thing man yeah thanks man thanks for having me and uh i have this solo cd if oh yes yeah, shapes yeah. Tell, tell, yeah. tell everybody about shapes. shapes yeah shapes well this is a project that uh started about probably 10 years ago a good friend of mine, Shane Terrio, inspired me to do a, a solo project. I had played on a, Shane's first two solo projects. If you don't know who Shane Terrio is, he's a, he was a Nashville session guy for a long time, played with the Neville Brothers, and then uh, played with the uh, Boz Skaggs. He was the one that actually got me an audition with Boz. Look at that. And um, then he, currently he is the music director for Hall and Oates and the music director for Daryl's house. So I was fortunate to meet Joel, uh, meet Shane through Joel Saunier doing sessions with Joel Saunier. Yeah. So 
Shane inspired me to do this record. He co-produced it with me and I was able to, through him, I was able to use some guys in New Orleans, uh, George Porter Jr., the bass player from the, the Meters, and then this great pianist, jazz pianist named David Torkinowski played on it. And then I used some guys here in in uh, Nashville, uh, Pat Coyle, great nice. jazz pianist. That I met with Michael McDonald. And then uh, Randy Smith and uh, uh, Kevin Adams and Kevin Ray, guys that I had been oh playing God. with for a long time. They played on it. And then I had uh, some guys from the Boss Gags band, Mike Miller, who played with Chick Corea and Gino Vanelli. He played on it. And so I was very fortunate to get some really exceptional guys to play on this record. Shane wrote some songs. I co-wrote a song with, with Kevin Ray. And then I did some some covers. of we did a Latin version of All Blues. But it was, um, you know, it was something I wanted to do years ago, back when people were still buying CDs, to be able to sell something at my clinics. Yeah. You know, so I kind of missed the, missed the boat on that. But um, it was just a labor of love. It's a different style of playing that I love to play that I'm not known to, to for. And it's uh, something I don't get to do as much as I would like to do. But, you know, as you know, being a successful musician, sideman, you have to play a lot of different styles. And instrumental yeah. music has always been something that I really loved and gravitated to. So it was uh, kind of a, uh, a milestone accomplishment that I always wanted to do. So. Every drummer's got to have a solo record, man. I've heard snippets of it, and it's fantastic. And what's the best you. way for people to hear the tracks, get the record? Well, you can get it. You can download the tracks from iTunes. It's available on Amazon. It's available on eBay. It will be available on Spotify. It should be already, but for whatever reason, my account got uh, hacked. So uh, you, you can download it on, on, on those, those platforms. Uh, and, you know, uh, I've had people reach out to me uh, just on social media uh, to buy a physical copy. You can get a hold of me on uh, Instagram or on Facebook if you want to buy a physical copy. Or you can get them, uh, like I said, you can get them on, on Amazon or you could get, you could buy them on eBay. Yeah, Instagram is Dave Northrop Drums. Also, the YouTube channel is very robust. Hundreds of videos on there, and uh, I love the record, man. Congratulations! I'm, it's in the back of my mind. There's that little guy that's on my shoulder that's like, "You got to put put out your polite uh, fuse act record, man." You know? Yeah, you do. I, I want to put do. out a little ten track thing. So iTunes, that's probably where I would buy mine. I could you could download all the tracks for what ten bucks? Oh yeah, Heck, yeah. Heck I love it. Long. Yeah. Killer, man. Well, yeah, we got to get together some for some overly sweet coffee, but yeah. um, I want to thank you for being overly sweet and uh, for the uh, yes. regular viewers of the show that don't see my co-producer and co-host Jim McCarthy. Jim will probably be back next week. Everybody, check out Jim McCarthy Vos dot com. That's Jim McCarthy Voiceovers dot com. And also, Jim, if if you guys are out there and you want to start your own podcast, my friend Jim has a thing called It's Your Show dot co, and he produces is about 20 or 30 podcasts and apparently everybody needs a podcast right now so dave thanks again man for joining me man you're you're brilliant you're sexy i love you man yeah, i love you too and i'm proud of you and i'm like i said rich redmond you have more energy than anybody i know and you can make a cup of coffee nervous <laughs> <laughs> i'll take it you're buddy the man. I yeah. love you too, and I'm very proud of you. And to all the listeners out there, please share this show, rate the show, give us a five star rating. If you can't find it in yourself to give me a five star rating, tell me why. I'll do whatever I have to do to get a five star rating. I'll come, I'll shuffle snow, I'll make you a meal, I'll cut your lawn. I need a five star rating. Leave us a review, it helps everybody find the show. And until next time, hey, we'll see you here, right here on the Rich Redmond Show. Dave, thanks, man. Thanks, Rich. God bless you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.